All right. Uh, so this presentation of the biostatistics for PYP males is uh, recorded because uh, at the time of the lecture we had the national day vacation. So we could not do the presentation live at that time. But it's important, so I recorded it for you. Um, okay, so without further ado, uh, measures of central tendency and spread. So first we'll go over the measures of central tendency. And these basically mean the mean, mode, and median. Right? So the mean is the average. That's another term for it. The equation for this is the sum of all values divided by the number of observations. Let's look at, it, at an example. So in this example, you have five participants, and each of them is giving a certain value, 13, 17, 14, 11, and 15. So if you add these up, the total would be 70. You take this total divided by the number of participants, that is 5, and the mean would come out as 14. Pretty straightforward. Next, we have the median. So this is the middlemost observation. That means that it lies exactly at the half of the distribution of your data. So 50% would be above the, the median and 50% of your data would be below the median. Okay? And to do this simply, you can arrange your data in ascending or descending order and find out the middlemost observation. All right? Let's take an example. So in this example, you have the values 11, 13, 14, 15, and 17. So this is relatively easy to look at. And you can figure out that the median is 14 because it lies in the middle. So there are three values above it and three values below it. That means 13, 12, and 11, and 15, 16, and 17. So that makes it the median. Okay? It's, it's dividing your sample into 50% above it and 50% below it. Okay. Next, you have the mode. This is the most frequently occurring observation. So, this is not commonly used in medical research, and the reason for that is simply because it's uh, it's used with nominal variables, and we don't often use them in uh, like medical research. We're more of a um, quantitative rather than qualitative. Okay. Um, so look, let's look at the mode in this uh, next example. So in this example, the, the mode is basically the most recurring value. So in this one, 13 is mentioned twice, and no other value has that repeated um, occurrence. So 13 here is the mode, okay? So the most frequently repeated value. Okay, so this is a table we made, uh, uh, and it summarizes like the mean, median, and mode. And a note here on the mode that you can see it's measured in nominal variables. So while nominal variables can be both qualitative and quantitative, um, it's most often uh, the nominal form most often lacks a numerical value. So it's uh, so it's a representation of qualitative data. Okay. When it has a numerical value, that means it's quantitative data, and 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 therefore the mode is like seldomly used in uh, medical research because usually have numbers attached to data okay next you have measures of dispersion or measures of spread so these are multiple let's start first with the range so it's the difference between the lowest and the highest observation so basically in this histogram the range you look at what is the lowest value it's 4 and what is the highest value is 18 so subtract subtract the 4 from the 18 and you'll get like 14 and that's your range. So 14% is the range of this sample and this histogram. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, let's go a step further. You want to calculate, uh, calculate the deviation of a sample. Okay. Um, so you notice here in the equation, let's look at the equation. You notice that there is uh, an X bar symbol. So that means that it's the sample mean. This is a representation of the sample mean. And we already took how to calculate the mean like a few minutes ago. So you take the value and you subtract it from the mean and then you add the second value subtracted from the mean and so on. And then you divide them by the number of the sample. That's how you get the uh, deviation. Okay. So look at, let's look at this uh, example. So the mean here, if you look at the data column, the mean here is 14. 
and then you have the data 13, 17, 14, 11, and 15. So you, you subtract it from 14. So 13, subtract, 13 minus 14 is negative 1. 17 minus 14 is positive 3, and so on. Then you add these up, okay? And you... So if your equation is correct, like, the dv, uh, the d if you do the equations correctly, the mean will always sum up to a zero, okay? So this is the point of this uh, part. Okay, let's go next to, into the variance. So it's the average square deviation from the mean, okay? And this is the equation, you can see it below. And if I added a square, so that's like the two um, after the bracket. So this is a this is a measure of dispersion within statistical theory. So there is a problem with this, is that when you square something, the, the unit, for example, uh, a kilogram becomes kilogram squared. Um, a, kilo, a meter becomes meter squared. So it, it, it changes the, the unit of the data. So you can't actually describe the data using the variance, but you can use the variance to find other standard deviation. All right? OK. Uh, let's look at this example. So here, we have the absolute deviations rather than the simple deviation. OK? So in an absolute deviation, there are no negative or positives. You just put down what, what's the value of difference, OK? So you just take out the uh, uh, negative and positives, and your total will be 8. You divide that by the mean of 5, and you'll have 1.6. Okay, so that's the absolute deviation mean. All right. Now, uh, squared deviation, you're basically uh, squaring every every point uh, point in the data set. And this, uh, you can look at it at the green column. And the total would be 20. And you divide that by 5, which is the mean. And the variance will be 4. And you've noticed down there, we've said the standard deviation is 2. This is because 2 is the root value of 4. Okay? So you use the variance to find out the standard deviation. Okay. So what's the standard deviation? The standard deviation is the square root of variance. So it is in the same unit as the individual observation, making them easier to interpret our data and present them. Uh, you can see the equation below. This equation is very important. Let's compare the formulas now of the sample variance and the sample standard deviation. So as you can see, the S represents the standard deviation. The S squared represents the variance. So when you take the square, that means we're, we're looking at the square root, okay? The square root of the variance. It's the same equation, but then you have the square root in the sample standard deviation. So important points to remember, I put them in the red box. So the standard deviation is the same in the same units as the data. The variance, which is the square root of the standard deviation, is in squared units. Okay. Uh, so you need to uh, d do a square root equation to find out the real units. Uh, for understanding the spread of data, the standard deviation would make more sense. Okay. As it describes the same units as used in the uh, data set. Okay, so let's have a small recall question here. So in a data set about heights in meters, which of the following units is correct? You can pause the video now and try to answer this on your own. All right, so the answer to this question is B. Why? So when we have a data set about heights in meters, the standard deviation would be also in meters because we said it would be in the same units as the data set, all right? Well, the variance would be in meter squared. If, you, if you're still not sure about this, you should go back and uh, check out the equations, all right? Uh, so if we, if we use the variance in this scenario, we cannot get an idea about the variability uh, of the heights, since it's representing area. Meter squared is a representation of area, and we want to figure out the height. So to avoid this, we take the square root of the variance, which in fact is equal to the standard deviation and then we can get and then with the standard deviation we can get an idea of the variability in our sample okay some symbols uh, that you need to be aware of so the symbol for the sample mean is an x with a bar above it the symbol for the population mean is the mu symbol 
you can see it in the upper right box uh, the symbol for the standard deviation is a small s while the symbol for the standard deviation of a population is the sigma symbol all right let's look at the equations now okay so if you look at the standard deviation uh, equations between the population and the sample they're basically the same however in the sample you notice that n uh, minus 1 okay so that's the only difference between the two uh, with regards to how the equation is shaped okay and of course uh, when we say um, sample standard deviation you need to figure out the sample mean not the population mean when we say the population standard deviation you need to figure out the population mean and so on so this is one point that is uh, that might confuse uh, you as a student so you need to pay attention to this and practice of course practice makes perfect okay so here's a small recall question so in a sample of nine students randomly selected from SRU with weights in kilogram as follows so 96 96 97 99 100 101 102 104 and 105 what I want you fi to find out is the um, mean value and the standard deviation so you can pause the video and try to do it like in a pen and paper all right so the answer for this question is the mean would be a hundred the standard deviation would be 3.3 .3. okay and uh, if you got this wrong you need to go back see the equations and try to do this again okay okay next we have the normal distribution so maybe we've talked about this before but let's do, go, go over it again so the normal distribution in the context of uh, biostatistic is the bell-shaped curve I'll show you a picture in a few seconds which idealizes the distribution okay so the at the center of this curve there is the population mean and the spread is given by the standard deviation okay but let's let's take a look let's take a look so here's a bell-shaped curve so the normal distribution of population values you can see it over here and you can see that the mean is exactly in the middle it looks like a really nice slanted bell-shaped curve that is symmetrical this is normal distribution all right so here's a here's a quick question to jog your memory up um, in a group of patients the blood pressure is normally distributed okay it has a mean of a hundred millimercury and a standard deviation of 10 millimercury what can you conclude from this statement so pause the video read through the uh, choices and figure out the answer all right so the correct answer is a about 50 percent of patients would have a blood pressure above 100 mhg and the reason for this is that we said uh, in a normal distribution the mean would be exactly in the middle so 50% of patients would be above the mean and 50% would be below the mean all right okay okay in this slide uh, we're discussing the normal distribution as the 68 95 99.7 rule okay so this rule is a very quick estimate it gives you a quick estimate of the standard deviation okay so if you look at it, it's like 68% of the population would lie within the first standard deviation, okay? 95 would lie within the second, and 99.9 .9 would lie within the third standard deviation, within a normal distribution, okay? So what you need to do, you need to first find out the mean, then subtract this mean from each data point. You square the differences, you add these up, and then you divide by the um, one number less than the number of data points, so n minus one. Then finally, you take the square root of that number, all right? And you'll figure out the standard deviation. Really easy. All right. So here, here's an example. So you can pause the video and try this one out. You know. Um, what you need to do is subtra subtract the mean from each data point to find the standard deviation. 
okay? The answer is written on the screen, but uh, just look at the curve and subtract the mean from each data point and you find the standard deviation easily. Okay, this is the same thing that we just spoke about, uh, about the range rule. Okay. So properties of a normal distribution. Uh, all right, so briefly, when we're discussing normal distribution, we're assuming number of, uh, uh, of I uh, ideas, okay? So when we're assuming random sampling, okay, uh, we're assuming that there was selection independence, so no participant was selected depending on the characteristics of other participants. They were randomly selected and uh, there was no to very low chance of bias in selection. And we're also uh, assuming the assessment independence so that there is no uh, faulty technique or, uh, or the results of one participant depended on the results of another. Okay. And finally, we're assuming the normality distribution. So what you see here that it's basically uh, a bell curve. So let's say you take a sample from an infinite, infinite population, okay? Uh, or rather, you take an infinite number of samples from a population, okay? And in each, you assess the blood pressure and the mean, and you plot them. So each time, it will have a bell-shaped curve because it's random and the three assumptions that we just mentioned, okay? Uh, this is also this also relates to the parametric and non-parametric testing that we mentioned in a previous uh, presentation. So the underlying probability distribution, okay, is the is the major difference between the parametric and non-parametric. So in parametric tests, we are assuming normal distribution, and non-parametric tests, we are assuming a non-normal distribution, which we will get to later in this uh, presentation. Okay. So if you remember before, I said the median divides the distribution in half. And that means uh, quantities such as quartiles, quintiles, and percentiles can be described as the median in the data set. So in a normal distribution, the mean, mode, and median are always in the middle. Okay? Just keep this in mind. So the median in this case would, would also equal a z-score of 0. The z-score is also called the standard score, uh, and it basically, you can see it, it's circled in red. It gives you an idea of how far the mean, how far from the mean a data point is. So if it's plus 3, that means the data point is plus 3 z-scores uh, z away from the mean. Okay. So technically, it's, it's measuring how many standard deviations be, uh, below or above. Um, the mean uh, your score is. That's like uh, the basic idea of it. And, do, and can easily be placed on the uh, normal distribution curve. Okay, let's go into the quartiles. So the quartiles are three. Okay, there is always three quarti quartiles in a normal distribution in a data set. And they would divide your data set into four equal parts or four quarters okay so the first quartile this is the q1 it is the lowest quartile the second quartile is in the middle and this means that it is the median okay because it's in the middle of the data set and the third quartile which is q3 is the highest quartile so um, if you look at it the first quartile is the 25th percentile of the data okay um, the median is the 50th percentile. So 50% of the participant would be above and below this. And the Q3 is the 75th percentile. That means that 75% of the population would be below this uh, quartile, Q3, and 25% would be above it, would fall above it in value. So these are just basic concepts that you need to keep in mind when you're looking at quartiles. And then you have something called the interquartile range. So uh, in this range, it's like 
it's the difference between uh, the the marginal difference between Q3 and Q1. Okay, it's the distance between them both, and it would give you an indication of the uh, spread. Okay, so it's a measure of spread of the middle 50% of the data set. Okay, you can say there are two 25% in the middle, so it will give you an indication of the of the spread in this uh, uh, range. Okay. Uh, quintiles, they're not commonly used, but let's give you a basic idea about them. So there are four quintiles in a data set and they would divide your data set into five parts. Okay. The first quintile, the one in red, would effectively split the data into a lower 20% and a higher 80%. Okay. The second quintile, the orange, would split your data into the lower 40% of values to the left and the upper 60% of values to the right and so on okay so 40 to 60 percent that's like the third quintile and uh, and so on okay I think pretty straightforward okay so finally we go into the final measure of uh, spread which is uh, the percentiles and um, okay so the standard normal distribution uh, as you can see here, it's useful for computing these percentiles. You can see 99th percentile, 98th percentile, and so on. So let's take an example. Uh, the median in a normal distribution is always the 50th percentile. So the first quartile would be the 25th percentile. The third quartile would be the 75th percentile. Okay, if you remember the quartiles. So they are, so they are related together. Okay, so in some instances, um, you'd find that the authors, for example, told you that uh, in our population, 95th, uh, uh, most of these values were below the 95th percentile. So y you'll have an idea what uh, they mean by that. Okay. Um, yeah. So in a data set, there will always be 99, 99 percentiles, and you can, and these would divide your data set into like 100 equal parts. Okay. Uh, all, you should always remember that the 50th percentile is the median. Yeah. All right. Okay, so the final part of the presentation is deviations from normality or normality. So this is a this is a relatively straightforward. So there are two things to keep in mind. So there is skewness of distribution and kurtosis. Okay. So skewness indicates direction, kurtosis indicates homogeneity. Let, let's take uh, let's uh, let's le take a look at the figures. You can see that um, when something is like negatively skewed, it will deviate to the right. This is the left figure. Okay, so you can see that it's like skewed on the left side, and the bell curve is being pushed to the right. And if you can see that the uh, the uh, population mean is like below the uh, standard uh, the uh, the median all right so it's less than the median okay so in a skewed distribution this should give you a hint in the skewed distribution you should always use the median okay do not be fooled by the presence of a mean because the mean would not be in the middle it would only be in the middle if it's normally distributed in the in the figure just uh, close to it the one on the right it is positively skewed that means the data is like is being shifted to the left so the mean is higher than the median again the median is used here to separate the data into two equal parts okay so as we said skewness would indicate direction so you have you can take a look positive skew negative skew and there is an easy way to remember this, uh, and by that I mean the mean, mod, and median. So in the symmetrical distribution, they're always in the middle. However, in negative distribution, uh, negative skew, um, you can memorize them that they are in alphabetical order. So mean, median, and mode, these are in alphabetical order. So the mean would be the lowest, the median would be in the middle of the data set, and the mode would be the highest in value. So that's just a trick to keep in mind, you know? Okay. 
So here's an example. And here you can clearly see that this is well, a negative or a positive uh, skew. Okay, so this is a positive skew, all right? It's being pushed to the left. Okay, kurtosis. So kurtosis means um, what is the homogeneity of your data? So the more homogeneous, that means the value in your data are similar. So like multiple people are getting the same blood pressure reading. Um, the more positive it would look like. You can see the one in the middle. It's like going up. It's peaking. Uh, like it's a tower. Okay. The example on the left is the zero kurtosis, and and you can see it's written Gaussian distribution. That means normal distribution. So it's the bell-shaped curve. And on the far left, you see the negative kurtosis. So there is lack of homogeneity between your uh, participants. So if you measure the glucose of uh, of people in your sample, you'd expect a Gaussian distribution, a normal bell curve. If everyone is giving you a different reading you will have a negative kurtosis. There's heterogeneity, okay? And so it will start to flatten down, okay? The curve will flatten. Okay, here are two examples. For example, the there's positive kurtosis in um, people's systolic blood pressures, okay? So most of the population are having their blood pressures, or in this sample, sorry, not population, are having their blood pressures between like the 120 and 150 range. And so it's starting to peak up. You can look at the curve, it's peaking up, right? And then you have these tails, which are like the sliding uh, slopes of the curve. They're still containing data. So these people are having hypertension, okay? So like 210, 240. That's like pretty dangerous. So maybe there's a problem with the instrument or something. You need to, th to consider that, Yeah. And on the left side, you have negative kurtosis. You can see there's not much uh, uh, variation in the uh, sample. Okay. Um, actually, actually, there is there is a variation in the sample. That's why it's uh, going down. It's not it's not showing the the very nice um, bell shaped curve. So there are no tails. Like everyone is be is either between thirty and sixty years of age. And that's that shouldn't like occur in a normal distribution. There are people who are like one years old, and so, so the pediatric population, and you have the elderly population. That will ch make the bell curve more apparent. Okay. So these were uh, a few fun examples. All right. So our advice for this presentation is that you go and practice on your own. It's heavily loaded. So list the variable types from the previous presentation know what they are, revise them, and then calculate. try to calculate means and standard deviations of some examples that you find online, okay? Um, some interesting ex uh, exercise you can do is to try to interpret the mean, median range of a sample, and then go over to interquartile range and standard deviation. So the, the note here is just practice. Um, for self-learning, there are two recommended sources. So Bonita's Basic Epidemiology should go and read Chapter 4. And Clinical Epidemiology, The Essentials by Fletcher's, you should go and read Chapter 2. If you have any questions, look it up first, like study the topic first. And then if there's still a problem, then uh, send me an email and I'll be happy to respond to you. All right. I will see you in the next lecture.